Well, good morning, Liberty Church. Good to see you this morning. I got to say this, Roll Tide. Got to, got to put that out there just, just to put that out there. I, I, I was praying. I was praying hard that they'd win simply so you'd show up this morning. You know what I'm saying? I'm like, Lord, please let them win so somebody shows up tomorrow morning. Glory to God. Hey, I want to welcome everyone watching online in the overflow room as well. Doris Sansbury, all the way from Grand Bay. Come on, Dora, give it up for Dora Walk, watching all the way from Grand Bay. Glad to have everyone here this morning. Well, I don't know if you heard about the uh, lawyer and the uh, preacher and the little boy who were on an airplane. The airplane was going down, and there was only three parachutes left. I mean, excuse me, two parachutes left. And so the lawyer says to everybody on the, those two guys, he says, look, I'm the smartest guy on this plane. The world needs me. I'm grabbing a parachute. He jumps out and uh, heads out. And the preacher looks at the little boy and says, son, there's only one parachute left. I've had a good life. God's been good to me. You still got a life to live. Just go ahead and take that parachute and I'll be okay. And the little boy says, preacher, don't worry about that because the smartest man just jumped out with my book bag. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, how many know that uh, Christmas is a wonderful time? And we're, can you believe we're already in December? Isn't it crazy? In December already, Black Friday just happened, and everything's going on, and people out there shopping and getting their stuff and, and all that. And, but it's, a, it more, it's more than just about a tree. We know that. It's, all more, it's really all about Christ. It's about his coming. And um, in more of a traditional setting, um, sometimes... The churches will celebrate the four Sundays prior to Christmas um, by calling it Advent, which means the coming. And, um, and we're going to actually gonna go traditional a little bit this year, and we're going to do that, and we're going to have like a, an Advent series. And each week we're going to take a, an aspect of God and, that he gave us through his son Jesus, and we're going to talk about it. And we're going to call this the Advent series. So, and so this morning what we're going to talk about is this characteristic that God brought, and that is hope. I don't know if you need hope, but I believe there's some people this morning that do need hope. Hope, hope, that Jesus is hope. So 1 Timothy uh, chapter 1, verse 1, uh, Paul says, Christ Jesus is our hope. Christ Jesus is our hope. Not only is he our hope, but Jesus brought his hope to the world. It tells us in 1 Peter 1 3, Blessed be the God and Father, the Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope. There's a living hope that you can walk with through Jesus Christ. What is hope? For your note's sake, definition hope is simply the desire that's accompanied by an expectation. A desire that's accompanied by an expectation. So, what is hopelessness? Hopelessness or a lack of hope would simply mean a sense that I don't have a future. That there's no future for me. Well, I'm here to tell you that there is nothing worse than having no hope. You know, some have said you can live for weeks with no food. And you can go days without water. And you can go minutes without air. But you can't last five seconds without hope. We're talking about hope this morning. I was, I was talking to our Spanish pastor, Yanel Cruz, and they have a Spanish ministry on Sunday nights right here across the hall, and love the Liberty Church Spanish congregation that we have. And he was down in Cuba, his home, a few weeks ago. And every time he goes to visit his family and down there and minister, he takes some money with him that he's stashed to the side and gives it away to his family. And he was down there, and he was having a conversation with his brother, and he gave him $200 like he'd done the time before. And his brother said to him, and, and I've been there, I've been to Cuba, and, and, and they have little. They have very little. And uh, his brother said, I don't want your money. He said, why don't you want my money? And this is what he said. He, he, said, he said, because your money won't do anything for me here. What good is your money? We can't even... They won't even allow us to do anything here. We can't invest. We can't start our own business. We can't, we can't buy anything. There's nothing to buy. So I don't even want your money. And then he said this. He says, because there's no hope here. That broke Yunel's heart. To hear his own brother say that he's living with no hope. Do you know, it is a tragic thing to wake up in the morning and not have hope. 
It's a tragic thing to, to, to crawl out of bed and, and know that there's not a purpose for your life. This is what we want to talk about and drill down on this, this thing called hope. Jeremiah 29, verse 11. I love this story. This is a, a good verse for a bad situation. How many need a good verse in a bad situation? It's not a bad verse in a good situation. It's a good verse in a bad situation. The children of Israel have been carried away captive into Babylon. They, they have no home. They have no uh, identity anymore. They don't even, are not even allowed to speak their own language anymore. They're, they don't even have their own customs anymore. They're not allowed to celebrate the holidays like they used to. They're, they're living in Babylon. They are slaves. They, they, their children are now being born into captivity as well, and they don't have a future. This is a good verse in a bad situation. Jeremiah declares from the Lord, Lord, he says, guess, guess what? For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Give me, I mean, no, God's got plans for you. He's got plans for you. You may not think there's a plan, but you got a plan that's already set in motion by a living God. Turn to your neighbor and tell him, I got a plan, baby. Come on. And you may not even know that plan yet, but God's got a plan. He says, I have plans for you, says the Lord. They're, these plans are for your good and not for your disaster to give you, guess what, a future and a hope. Even if you think at this very moment, I don't have much to live for, let me tell you something. Throw that out the window. There's a plan set in motion already for you. If you knew the plan, one scripture says, it would blow your mind. Your imagination can't even capture the plan that God still has for you. I have a plan for you. It's not a bad plan. It's a good plan. It's a great plan, God says to these people caught in captivity. A plan with a future and plans with a hope. James 4.8, I love this passage. God says, if you'll draw near to me, I'll draw near to you. And I think this is one of the keys of having hope is, is, is to come near to God. Because people that are near to God have hope. You can't be close to God who is the author and the finisher of all your hope and not have hope yourself. Come on. You, you, you can't be near an entity or a God who has the possession of all plans and not feel like you got a plan too. It's all, come about, it's all about being near to God. And people that are near to God have hope. And people that are not near to God long for hope. I want to ask you this question. What is the purpose of hope? Why do we even, even need hope to begin with? Well, Scripture tells us that oh, hope is an anchor. It's an anchor. Uh, Hebrews 6, 19, this hope we have as an anchor of the soul a hope both sure and steadfast in which one enters within the veil. What's the purpose of an anchor? An anchor does, does two things. It, it brings stability to your life, and it also keeps you from drifting. There are two reasons we need hope in our lives. Number one, you need hope to keep yourself from drifting. Now, it's a known fact, and it's true, that we are prone to always be drifting. You, you may not even, so the thing about drifting is, you're in a boat, and you don't even realize you're moving, but you're moving. Something's carrying you. Something is moving you down the stream or down, down the, the, through the ocean. Something is going on that you don't even see under the surface, and it's causing you to drift, and it's easy to drift away from God. It's easy to drift away from your goals. It's easy to drift away from your purpose. It's easy to drift away from people that you love. And it's easy to drift away from your dreams because we constantly drift without even knowing we're drifting. That's why we have to have hope in Christ to keep us anchored and to keep us from drifting with the culture that we live in. Turn to your neighbor one more time. You're going to help me preach this one. Tell him you need an anchor. Come on. And it gives you stability in a crisis. It keeps the boat from pitching and drawing back and forth. 
It keeps you stable. There's chaos all around, but you're tied down to something, and it keeps you stable. I want to show you a picture of an old, an old anchor. We all understand what an old anchor looks like. T- typical. That's hope right there, baby. You can't even see it, but it's underneath you. It's down underneath the surface. It's under the water. It's, it's holding you in place. It's stabilizing you, and it's keeping you from drifting. Let me show you. This, I'm going to show you a picture of the chain connected to the largest anchor in the world. That's a man walking on a chain. Each link weighs 500 pounds tied to a 75-ton anchor to the largest, uh, one of the largest anchors in the world. And you know what that is right there? That's a picture of hope. That's how much hope God has around you, man. He'll swallow you up in his hope. You'll, you'll dr- he'll drown you in his hope. He'll consume you with his hope that he, God has got so much hope that when you just murmur and complain, it breaks his heart because you have no idea the plans he has for you. Come on, give Jesus some praise this morning. And the bigger the ship, the bigger the anchor. If you have a small life, you just need a small little anchor. But if you want to live a big life, guess what? An abundant life, you need a big anchor. And God's got the anchor just for you. It's all a matter of what you are looking for in your life. I need to keep an anchor with me. All Where do people go for hope? People are always searching for hope. They, they go to the medicine cabinet for hope. They go to the drug dealer on the corner for hope. They go to the bar for hope. They go to the concert circuit for hope. They go on expensive, extravagant vacations for hope. They buy things thinking it's going to give them a little hope. Uh, I want want you to know real hope is based uh, on God's word, not my wishes. God's hope is based on not my emotion, but what God has said. I base my hope not on what I feel, but my hope is linked, anchored to what God's done and what God said. And Jesus came to bring you hope. (laughs) <laughs> That's why we celebrate Jesus' is coming. It's hope. It bring, he's brought hope to the world. Before he came, man, we had little hope. That's why we celebrate Christmas like we do. It's the biggest time of the year. So there's three kinds of hope. This isn't in your notes, but just write this down to the side or on the back. <clears throat> three kinds of hope. You have wishful hope. What's wishful hope? Wishful hope is like, you're late for work, you're late for school, you're late for a meeting, you drive down the road and you go, I hope that light stays green. <laughs> you know, I hope no one gets in my way. <sighs> That's wishful hope. Let me tell you something, that light's gonna turn red. You know it's gonna turn red. <laughs> I, wish, I wish I could win the lottery. You have more odds of going to the moon as an astronaut than winning the lottery. That's the truth. That's the statistical truth. That's wishful hoping. Then you have this expectation hope or expectant hope, which is um, what a farmer has. He sows seed into the ground, and when he leaves, he expects there to be a harvest. Now, he knows there's a possibility it may not happen because it depends on some other elements that he's not in control of, but there's an expectancy. Listen, what do you call a mother who's pregnant? You call her what? You what? Hey, what's going on inside there? You, you what? You expecting? And make sure when you ask that question, you know good and well that woman is expecting. Because I've made that mistake before. <laughs> I was at a restaurant. I was trying to start, start a conversation with this little waitress and everything. And I mean, it was obvious to me in the world that she was pregnant, you know? And so I said, hey, when's the baby due? And she goes, there's no baby coming. I'm like backpedal as fast as I can. Well, I'll tell you what, when one does, it's going to be a beautiful baby. Come on. <laughs> oh, man. And number three, there's certain hope. You have certain hope. What is certain hope? You know this is absolutely going to come to pass. 
It's not based on your feelings, but it's based on the fact that God said it. And when God says it, he cannot lie. You have a God who cannot lie. If God says it, it's going to happen. That's a certain hope. Come on. And this Bible is filled with 7,000 statements that God made that we call promises. And there's a promise for you in one of these places right here in this book. Uh, And there's a promise for you to hold on to that becomes your anchor, that ties you to a stable place, uh, that you're not drifting and you're not wandering back and forth and your emotions aren't all over the place. Uh, Yeah, you may wake up feeling depressed. Maybe wake up feeling discouraged. You may feel overwhelmed at times. But if you will tie yourself to a promise in the Word of God, He can cannot lie. That's one thing God cannot do. He cannot lie. Mm. So Jesus talks about hopelessness from time to time. And in Luke 18, 1, he says, always pray and never lose hope. How do I keep from losing my hope? Well, I don't panic and I just pray. I just pray. He says, don't lose hope. Always pray. It's just It's just about praying, talking to God, being in conversation with the Lord, tying into the the promise that he's given us and walking it out. So let's talk about this hopeless situation for a little bit. What causes hopelessness? What causes you to feel hopeless about your marriage? What causes you to feel hopeless about your health? What causes you to feel hopeless about your your, your uh, finances? What causes you to feel hopeless about the future that you have? What is the source of these hopeless feelings. I'm glad you asked me that because I'm going to give you 10 reasons why people feel hopeless. And I believe one of these might even come close to you. You can write these down in your notes. Number one, why people feel hopeless is they feel alone. They feel like they're out here all by themselves. For whatever reason, they feel like they've been abandoned that there's really no one connected to them or nothing connected to them that that will keep them um, from feeling these hopeless situations. I I was uh, I was talking to somebody a while back and they said, "What you doing?" I said, "I'm getting ready to go eat." And, and uh, they said, "Well, who are you going with?" I said, "Well, I'm, I got nobody. I got a book here. I'm going to go get a bite. And I got to get back." And are you going by yourself? I said, "Yeah." How can you go eat by yourself? They said like that. How can you go eat by yourself? I'm like, is there a law that I can't eat by myself that I don't know about? I could never eat by myself. That's just like the worst thing in the world. Everybody in a restaurant looks at you and goes, oh, look at that poor isolated, lonely guy reading a book. I'm like, seriously? I love being by myself. You know what I'm saying? I grew up with three kids in the house, man. I love being by myself. I don't care if it's just one french fry. I'm going to enjoy that by myself. Mm. You can be in a crowd and still feel alone. You can be in the middle of Denny Stadium. Is that what it's called? Jack Denny? What is it? Jack Denny? See, I just gave it up. Brian Denny. I'm not a... Y'all like, he's an imposter. He doesn't know the name of the stadium. (laughs) Brian Denny Stadium. Excuse me. Don't blister me, but, and still feel like you're alone. It's not a amount of people you're around. It's what's going on inside. So this is, this is what happens. You, you feel alone. Number two, life seems like it's out of control. Like you can't get a handle on, so you can't seem to bring things in line. It's like it's always something going on and around you and in you, and, 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 you, and, and it's never going to change. It brings hopelessness and despair. It's never going to change. Number three, we don't see a purpose in it. We don't, we don't see that there's a, there's a purpose in this stuff. Let me say, see this, pain is okay if it has a purpose. I don't mind you sticking me with a needle if it's going to make me feel better. But you're just going to stick me with a needle just to stick me with a needle. I'm not interested. Come on. In fact, don't even tell me when you're sticking me with a needle. I don't even want to. I just do it. I, I'm the biggest baby when I go to a doctor's office. You think, you know, a man, grown man. Should, I'm like, oh, you kidding me. You got to give me a what? A shot? <sighs> and I just dread it. I could never be a drug addict. I never could. I could. I just. 
That's just like sick. <laughs> Number four, gr you grieve a loss or a, a you've had a series of losses in your life. Someone close to you has passed away or someone close to you and a couple of people close to you or perhaps um, financial loss, uh, uh, compacted on other financial losses. And, and so there's this sense of loss that just overwhelmed you. It causes hopelessness. Number five, I just don't have what I need. And I'm never going to have it. I, I, I don't have enough money. I'm never going to have enough money. I'm never, my health has just abandoned me. I, I'm never going to get better. I'm never going to feel better. I'm, not gonna, I, I'm never, never going to get out of this, this place where I just don't have enough energy. I'm just like, just always tired. I, 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 I feel stuck like I'm in a dead-end situation. You don't have what you need, and it causes hopelessness, this heaviness to come over your life. Mm -hmm. And the enemy will use these situations to bring you into a place of the Old Testament calls it a heaviness. The New Testament, or in our modern day, we would call it depression. And he'll move you in quickly into depression. He, the devil, the enemy has no greater desire than to bring you into a place of heaviness or despair or depression. That's why Jesus said, one of the things I came to do is I came to set the captives free, to free you from this heaviness, this depression, the spirit of heaviness that you're on or under. There is a way out. There is, listen, you, it's going to be okay. You're going to be all right. Number six, why do I have hopelessness? Because, because I've done something wrong. And so guilt and shame and regret and remorse just overwhelms me. And I can't seem to forgive myself for what I did. Mm, this is really a huge one. So many people live with this beat down sense of plastic smile on their face, but their heart is heavy because they feel this load of guilt and shame. Mm. Man, there's nothing like seeing someone set free from this guilt and shame. That brings hopelessness. That's why Jesus died. His blood washes your mistakes. Come on. He doesn't expect you to be all the time perfect. You need to be working better. But listen, we're going to make mistakes from time to time. And guess what? He washes your mistake away. And one mistake isn't worse than another mistake. There's no like big mistakes and small mistakes. They're all bad. His blood washes your sin for a white lie as he does for someone that has killed someone. His same blood, same sin. Number seven, you're hopeless because you've been wounded by someone. Maybe physically abused as a child. Maybe molested, maybe raped, maybe um, some kind of a mental abuse and bitterness and resentment has set in your heart. And, you know, you just kind of shoved it to the side and you said, you know what, uh, I'm just, it happened and that's the way it is. I'll never talk to that person again. I'll never pray for that person. I'll never do anything. But, and I'm just going to move on in life. And that thing is still down there. And you've never brought it into the light and you've never brought that issue into the cross and you've never asked the Lord to heal you of that violation that's taken place towards you. And eventually, over time, it doesn't start immediately, but over time, that bitterness, resentment, and the hatred begins to bring hopelessness to you. And you're wondering, what in the world? How, do, where, how come I feel this way? Seems like things are going well. Why do I feel this way? It's because there's a seed of anger and bitterness and resentment that you've never brought under the blood of Christ. Am I helping you out this morning? You're like, no, I'm not saying nothing. You're going to think I'm hopeless. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not saying nothing. Just go keep reading. Number eight, number eight, you're hopeless because <clears throat> you're pulled in the wrong direction. See, we, 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 we constantly live in this culture that's pulling you in, to drift you into a whole another direction, a materialistic, self-centered direction, a... Um, hate-filled direction, a jealous direction, a greed 
uh, direction. And so you feel pulled. And, and over time, after, you know, fighting, you know, and resisting, you just kind of like get wore down. And you begin to get hopeless. Hmm. Number nine, you feel hounded by fear. You're frightened and you're scared. And you're fearful of this and you're fearful that I can name all the fears there are. There's a, hundreds of them. Fear has gripped your heart and it's brought you hopelessness. And number 10, when it looks like there's defeat, you're not on the winning side, the enemy is taking you down. And uh, you're not going to pull this one off. Like most people in Alabama in the third quarter last night. Come on. <laughs> It was like, there's no hope in the crimson tide. Everyone was begging God for mercy. <laughs> Let me give you some good news really quick. You can find hope. Here's the answer. Hope where you find hope. You know what? You, here, you can go simply to the Lord's Prayer and find hope. Amen. The Lord's Prayer is filled with nothing but, but hope. I'm going to read it from the New American Standard Bible. Pray then on, in this way, Jesus said, Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. In this passage of Scripture is nothing but hope. Let's just unpack it. Number one, go back and you can write this off to the side of number one. Your reason you feel hopeless is because you feel alone. What does the Jesus say? You need to remind yourself, our Father. We have a loving Father. How can you be alone when you have a loving Father? How can you ever be alone? Well, I don't see him. Well, that doesn't make any sense. You don't, you, you don't see a lot of things, but you believe in them. You don't believe in, I mean, you believe in electricity. Do you see electricity? You, you believe in wind. Do you see the wind? Our Father, he's there. Whether you feel him, sense him, know it or not, God is there. You are never alone. Though I walk with you through the valleys of the shadow of death, he will always be with you, our Father. Number two, when you feel hopeless because your things are out of control, you say, hallowed be thy name. What does that mean? Oh, you are all power, Father. You are revered. You are hallowed. You are honored because you are so powerful. How can things be out of control? How can things be uh, somewhat uh, never going to uh, come in line? How can that be true when all power source is right there at your beckoning, working with you if you allow him to? Man, this is good stuff, Pastor JP. This is good. I'm, I'm, I'm giving you hope this morning. Come on, church. Number three. When you don't see a purpose, well, well that fits right into his plan when, when thy kingdom come. Well, yeah, you don't feel like you have a purpose because you're looking at your kingdom, but I mean, he, you got to look at his kingdom. He's building his kingdom. Even if it takes the bad in my life, uh, he'll fit it into his plan. Even if it takes the, the mistakes you made, he'll fit it into his plan because he's working on a kingdom, not your kingdom, his kingdom. And if you believe that he's working on a bigger picture and get his perspective and look into the heavens, what he wants to do on the earth, guess what? You'll have hope. It's not all about you, baby. Turn to your neighbor and say, it's not all about you, baby. Come on, just tell him. It's his picture. It's his kingdom. And number four, we grieve a loss or have some series of losses. But here's the good news. God has a greater purpose if I surrender to God's purpose by saying, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In other words, his perfect will isn't always done on earth. Sometimes it's not even done in the time frame of earth. Sometimes his perfect will passes past you because God lives in eternity and you live in time. So you have to understand that his will will be done. He's working on it. It's going to happen. You have promises to back that up. Number five, you have hopelessness because you don't have what you need. Well, he's promised to meet 
all of my needs by do, doing what? By giving us this daily bread. We pray, God, give us this daily bread. Not monthly bread, not annual bread, not biannual bread, not decade bread. Give us this what? Daily, daily bread. What are you, you need daily bread. You need daily substances. And that's what God provides. He knows what you need today and will give you what you need today. He will provide in that sense of loss, in these series of losses, he will provide for you this bread that you, you need. Number six, you've done something wrong. Well, guess what? Jesus paid it all. And he's paid for everything you've done wrong and everything you will do wrong. You're forgiven and you will be forgiven. The scripture tells us there is therefore now no condemnation for those who, who are in Christ Jesus. Mm, I love that scripture. He forgives us our debts. Write that down. He forgives us our debts. He forgives us of our wrongs. And number seven, we talked about being deeply wounded by someone. Well, guess what? As we forgive our debtors, we, we expect God to forgive us of all that we've done, but we can't forgive them for what they've done wrong. You're expecting God to do something for you, but you won't turn around and do it for somebody else. So you forgive. And as you begin to forgive, hope begins to rush into your heart again. Number seven, You've been deeply wounded. Excuse me, number eight. Um, you pulled in the wrong direction. Guess what? I feel powerless to break this habit or addiction sometimes. But God has promised to lead us not into temptation. In other words, he will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you can endure. So we can never say, well, you know what? I just couldn't, I just couldn't overcome it. I couldn't, I couldn't. There wasn't anything in me to do. No, that's not true. He will not, he will not lead you to a place that you cannot overcome. And number nine, you're hounded by fear. Well, when I feel frightened, Jesus in me is greater than the fear because he delivers us from all evil. Amen. Deliver us from evil, Father. Deliver me from my fears. Mm. Isaiah 43, verse 2, when you pass through the waters, I will be there. I will be with you in the rivers. You shall not over, they will not overwhelm thee. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. Number 10, when it looks like defeat, when it looks like defeat, I'm on the winning side all the time. This is not the end of the story because why? Because thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth. How many know you're made of earth and you're earth? You, will, you were born out of the earth. You will go back into the earth. You're, the kingdom of God is going to come and it's going to fill you and overwhelm you. Amen. So I close with this. I need a key. Somebody have a key? Anybody have a key? Throw up there? This is not a trick thing. Thank you, bro. Appreciate it. You're like, I was hoping you'd give me, ask for some money like a few weeks ago. <laughs> give you money back. Um, so this is, oh, this is an Alabama key. I like that. So this is Alabama Crimson. So this is the key. You may not see this. I'm going to hold it real still so maybe if you want, you can view that really closely. So this is a key. Now, it's a plain key. It's nothing. It's just a piece of metal. It's just a piece of nothing. But if you look at it, and if I'm looking at I mean, it's, it's jagged, it's been cut on, it's not, it's not as smooth as it maybe once was, it's, um, it's been beat on. Your life is a key. And the things that you've been through and things that has happened, have happened to you, God's been working on something. And his, his desire is that you not cash in all these things that have come against you and just fall into this place of God will never use it. No, he wants you to believe that everything you've gone through, every, every cut, every beat down, every, every, uh, every up and every down that's represented in this key has a purpose, has a plan. And guess what? There is a door that this key fits into. 
And not every door does this key fit to. In fact, there's thousands of doors this key won't fit into. But there is one door that this key is the right fit, the right cut, the right place. Uh, and if you will put your key, your life, uh, if you will allow God to move you in the direction that he longs to move you into, you're going to find the door. And it's going to be a perfect fit. And it's going to unlock uh, the future and the destiny that God has for you. I have plans for you, says the Lord. Not to do you harm, but to do something great. It may come at a cost. It may come at loss at times, but there's a plan. And on the other side, I'm telling you, it's going to be a beautiful, beautiful thing. There's a door that he's making to fashion you this key into. It's going to unlock and bring you into your purpose and into your destiny, into a place that no one else has access to. This hopeless season is God making you into a key. And one day, it's all going to click. And it's just going to open. And you're going to go, I would have gone through everything I've gone through and more had, not, had I known what this door would hold. I want you to just bow your heads and pray with me this morning. Perhaps you're here and you have been in the pit of despair. Mm. Even this morning, as we were praying together in our prayer group, just since that um, there was like a sense of heaviness over some people in this room. And listen to me, even a sense of suicide, a sense of absolute despair and hopelessness. In fact, for some of you here, it took everything you had just to get here. You didn't feel like being here. You didn't even really want to be here. You literally crawled emotionally into this place. And you feel like you are, the, the floods have overwhelmed you and you're going down and you're out of air. And the enemy has oppressed you and, and darkened your heart and your soul. that just because I think it doesn't make it true and just because my mind says something doesn't mean I do it that this will pass this is a spirit of heaviness and it's going to pass God has a solution he's got a plan and it's beautiful in my life so Father right now by prayer in the name of Jesus and even the authority that you've given me I Lord God speak against darkness heaviness depression and even suicidal thoughts in this room and in the name of Jesus, I declare this is a no judgment zone. This is a no condemnation zone. This is a no hopeless zone. In the name of the Lord, I declare hope. I declare life. I declare victory. I declare warriors learning how to take control of their thoughts and their emotions and stand on the promises of God. I thank you, Lord Jesus, that in you there is all hope. In you there is all victory. And in you there is all purpose. And for that, we will give you praise. Come on, stand to your feet and give him praise this morning, church. Uh, come on, let's give him praise for he is a God of hope. He's a God of hope. Come on, give him praise. He's a God of hope, church. He's given you an anchor. 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 Come on, there's an anchor tied to your heart. There's an anchor tied to your soul this morning. Thank you for an anchor, Lord. Thank you for an anchor. Woo! Hallelujah. Turn your neighbor and tell him, don't trip on my anchor. Come on. Come on. There's an anchor tied to my heart. An anchor tied to my soul. We're going to go into this Christmas season, Daniel, knowing that there's hope in a world of hopelessness. And people are going to see our anchor. And they're going to hear the splash when it falls into the sea of humanity. We have a God of hope. Close this out.